Welcome to lesson four of our phases of matter unit. Now that we have some understanding of phase changes and what's required in order to move between different phases, the rest of this unit is really going to focus on one particular phase of matter, which is the gas phase. So with that in mind, we're going to start by trying to understand how the particles of a gas behave. When we think about how the particles of a gas should behave, we use what's called kinetic molecular theory to describe the behavior of what we call an ideal gas. It's important to understand that an ideal gas is a hypothetical perfect gas and that real gases actually don't behave in this way in all conditions. At the same time, this model of a perfect or ideal gas is really useful when considering the behavior of every gas on the planet. Kinetic molecular theory proposes five major conditions that describe an ideal gas. The first is that the particles have a negligible volume. What that means is that the volume of the individual atoms or molecules that make up the substance of the gas is so tiny compared to the overall volume of the gas that we might as well treat it like it's nothing at all. The second postulate is that the particles will always move in random straight lines. They'll move in those random straight lines until they hit something, at which point they'll be deflected to move in another random straight line, and so on and so forth. We talked about this before, but the third postulate is that the particles will have completely elastic collisions. This means that when the particles of the gas hit each other or hit anything else, they conserve all of their energy 100%. The total amount of energy going into the collision equals the total amount of energy coming out. The fourth is that there's no attractive forces between the particles of the gas. We've talked about intermolecular attractive forces before and how important the strength of those are in determining the phase of a particular substance. But in a gas, those particles are moving so quickly and so far away from each other that they have no intermolecular attractive forces at all. And finally, we postulate that the particle speed is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. As that Kelvin temperature increases, the speed or the kinetic energy of those particles also increases. These are the postulates of this perfect ideal gas. Now, of course, we need to understand that this does not describe real gases. Real gases actually violate the kinetic molecular theory in all five of those postulates, but that really only happens in any measurable way in specific conditions, particularly when the particles of the gas are moving very slowly and when they're very, very close to each other. To understand this, take a moment and think about what happens as you put the particles of any substance closer together. They're going to start to exhibit those intermolecular attractive forces, which is going to cause the behavior of the particles to deviate from a theoretical place where they don't have any intermolecular attractive forces at all. And of course, when the real particles of a substance hit anything, some amount of energy is lost to the larger universe. This is particularly true when there's intermolecular attractive forces pulling those particles together. So it's important to understand that real gases do absolutely violate these ideal conditions, but only when they've been caused to move very slowly and are really close together. In other words, when they're at low temperatures and very high pressures. That's when we'll see deviation from ideal behavior. But at high temperatures and low pressures, when the gases are moving very quickly and are not squeezed together, we'll see ideal behavior, or at least close enough that we can treat the gas like it's an ideal gas. You've probably noticed that pressure is starting to become a big deal in our conversations here in gas land. And that's because gases are really the only phase of matter that's really affected by a particular change in pressure. Pressure is just defined as the force exerted over an area. Anything with mass can exert a force. And that of course includes the atmosphere. That includes me pushing down on the desk. That includes you sitting in your chair. You're exerting pressure on the matter that you come into contact with. Normal atmospheric pressure, which is defined as the pressure exerted by the atmosphere at sea level, is actually 14.7 pounds of pressure per square inch. That means that as we all sit here under the atmosphere, the atmosphere is actually exerting almost 15 pounds of pressure on every square inch of our body. We don't actually feel that, and the reason for that is because we've evolved to live at sea level or close to it, and so that's sort of the normal operating state. But if we were to double the pressure, we'd certainly feel that. And you feel this when you start to do things like go to the bottom of a swimming pool. You start to feel the pressure push in on your body, and you probably feel less comfortable than you do under normal conditions. 
Because gases are affected so much by changes in temperature and pressure, we need to have a reference point or a standard at which to discuss them. The standard reference point for temperature and pressure is called STP or standard temperature and pressure. This is provided on reference table A, which actually indicates the significance of this particular reference value. Standard pressure is defined as the atmospheric pressure at sea level. In other words, one atmosphere's worth of pressure, which can also be defined as 101.3 kilopascals of pressure. These two values are equivalent. They are the same thing in different units. Standard temperature is defined as zero degrees Celsius or 273 degrees Kelvin, which of course you've already learned are the same thing or are equivalent units. There are a couple different versions of pressure that we should be familiar with. The standard unit for pressure is called the Pascal, named after Blaise Pascal, who you see here in repose. It's defined as one Newton per meter squared, which is roughly the amount of pressure you would feel if you took an apple, held it three feet above your hand, and let it drop into your hand. That force that you would feel is approximately one Newton Another unit, which is not a standard unit, is the tor, which refers to one millimeter of mercury in a barometer. Let's take a moment and see how a barometer works. A barometer is a device used for measuring atmospheric pressure. It can actually use any liquid you want, but we usually use mercury because mercury is so dense. If we were going to use water, our barometers would have to be considerably taller in order to get the same kind of utility out of them that we get out of a column of mercury that can easily stand on a desk. The mercury is put into a vacuum tube so that there's no internal pressure being exerted on the mercury. And the mercury pool that forms at the bottom is exposed to atmospheric pressure. As the atmospheric pressure changes, this is going to affect the pressure that's exerted on the mercury and will as a result change the height of the column of mercury in the barometer. We can use this to learn all sorts of things about the weather. And so if you listen to the weather, you'll often hear them talking to about things like a high pressure or a low pressure system moving into the area. What that means is that a high pressure system causes the column of mercury in the barometer to rise as the atmospheric pressure pushes down more on the column of mercury. And a low pressure system causes the column of mercury to fall because the atmospheric pressure is considerably less. Thanks for watching our discussion of ideal gases and our little diversion into pressure and how it works. Make sure that you can do the following here at the end of this lesson. Make sure that you can explain the behavior of an ideal gas using kinetic molecular theory. Also make sure that you can describe when a particular real gas could deviate from ideal behavior in specific conditions of temperature and pressure. In terms of pressure, make sure that you can explain what pressure is and that you can convert between different pressure units. Can you go between atmospheres and kilopascals? If so, you're pretty much good for the rest of your life. But you might also want to be able to convert between things like PSI, or pounds per square inch, and TOR, or millimeters of mercury in a barometer. The conversion factors for these will be given to you whenever you need them. And finally, make sure you can explain how a barometer works. How changes in atmospheric pressure lead to changes in the height of the mercury column within the barometer. If you can do all of those things, you're in a great place. If not, take a moment, write down any questions that you have, and you can always leave those questions in the comments below the video, or you can get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.